of all, Mr. Dan Quick. seconds to answer a question. Candidates, if they so choose, will also be allowed a 30-second rebuttal to a comment made by the other candidate or for clarification for an answer. About halfway through, the candidates will ask each other a question, and then uh, I have four lightning round questions which will be answered with uh, one word. I think we can actually do that. Um, and then at the end, uh, each candidate will have a closing statement of one minute. Our timekeepers are from leadership tomorrow, thank you. They'll keep the candidates aware of how much time they have left. If the candidate goes over time, I will politely interrupt so as to keep the evening moving. The candidates drew lots for opening and closing statements and the order of question. Uh, and so we're going to start tonight with the opening statement by Mr. Jacob. First, I'd like to thank the Grand Island Independent for uh, hosting and moderating this uh, forum. I'd like to thank leadership tomorrow for uh, Keeping time, I'd like to thank Mr. Mr. Greg Newhouse for, for attending as well. Um, I'd like to thank those all attending and uh, uh, watching at home. And finally, I'd like to thank all those uh, all the people that I've uh, visited with on the campaign trail. Um, it's been great. Uh, I've learned a lot from from everyone that I've met. Um, I'm sure you're all getting a little little tired of the uh, of the, uh, the election year and uh, not ready for it to be over. And uh, the, um, the, um, uh, but, uh, but we cannot deny that Grand Island uh, has, a, has a huge choice to make in this upcoming election year. That's why I'm standing here before you, because I believe that I'm the best choice to represent Grand Island, and not just working families, but all the citizens of Grand Island. There are many big issues to work on in the legislature, and especially with this being a budget year. I want to be in Lincoln to be a part of that. I will be a voice for working families and business to make sure that Grand Island is well represented. If elected, I can guarantee you I work hard every day to ensure that Grand Island receives their fair share from the state and work to improve our state as a whole. Grand Island deserves a legislator who isn't afraid to work on both sides of the aisle and to come to common sense solutions to everyday problems. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Quick. Mr. Newhouse. Thank you. <clears throat> Practicing law, I often help people in times of great difficulty. I help them overcome those difficulties and put their lives back together. You'll soon decide who's going to represent you in the legislature. The legislature is at a crossroads. The skills that I have honed in my law practice will help me to be effective in the legislature. Effective representation takes more than just hard work. It requires the ability to negotiate, to, to debate, and to build a consensus. You must be forceful and yet understand the values and the position of your adversary. You need an analytical mind. You must work with those whose positions are diametrically opposed to your own. And the, law, the practice of law requires those exact same skills. I understand the value of hard work. Leslie and I have worked very hard to get to the positions we're in. I have no rich relatives. We've inherited no fortune. My father died when I was 19. And I, I worked my way through college doing construction jobs. I poured basement walls, and I was a brick tender. And during the school year, I tended bar and worked retail. After college, Leslie and I worked and saved to pay for law school. John was just four months old when I started, and Leslie stayed home with him, so I worked as a law clerk and took as many hours to graduate early as possible. While law school normally takes three years, I graduated in two. Money was tight. Building a law practice uh, means that you pay everybody else first and you take what's left over, if anything. I never missed a payroll. I know the value of money. Because I understand the value of hard work and money, we had to be, and we had to be so conservative with our money, I value every penny. And I'll take that same fiscal conservancy to Lincoln. I'll work both hard and smart. 
Thank you, Mr. Newhouse. Okay, we're going to start with the questions. The first question is for Mr. Quick and Dr. Watkins, I believe you have that question. Thank you. First question concerns a topic that's been in the news a great deal over the last several months and has to do with our state's prisons. The state is struggling on a number of fronts to keep its corrections department properly staffed and maintaining staff after they have been hired. What would you consider as guiding principles to address the issues facing our state prisons? Mr. Quick. Well, I know that's, uh, that is going to be a, a big uh, a thing to handle. Um, those uh, men and women that work at the prison are working in dangerous jobs, and uh, I think one of the issues is, is they're working a lot of mandatory overtime, they're understaffed, so working a lot of mandatory overtime, and uh, I, I believe from what I understand, they're underpaid. So I think if we can work to uh, get their wages up, and uh, I think it will entice others to apply for those jobs, and then we have to make sure that there's safety in the workplace. We've got to make sure that those people are kept safe, uh, and out of harm's way. And uh, eventually along the way, we're going to have to work towards uh, some type of prison reform so we can uh, reduce the numbers in the prison. And I think that will help with that situation as well. Mr. Newhouse. Thank you. I, I agree. Funding is going to be essential in, in our prison reform. And I think Governor Ricketts is, is approaching it that way. When, when you have a dangerous situation, it's hard to it's hard to retain good people, and funding is going to be part of it. I think another thing that we need to, to look at is facilities. I, I like the federal model where we have the nonviolent offenders uh, facilities. Yankton, South Dakota uh, is an example. They took a, a, an old college campus and they turned that into a prison. It's, there's no bars, there, there are no uh, fences, and those guards are safer by far, and I think we need to look at doing something like that. Um, the other thing is safety, and uh, you touched on a good point, safety of the, of the guards. When a, when a prisoner is there and he's got two or three life sentences, he has nothing to lose by killing a guard or another prisoner. And if we take away the death penalty, I think we're, we're putting them in, in worse, worse harm that will cause an even greater staffing problem. Thank you. Um, the only thing I'd like to add is, uh, I think we do need to look at people who come out, maybe out of the drug courts, maybe they don't belong in a, in a facility where there are dangerous criminals. Uh, I think rehab would be the way to look at that, and I think that would also help reduce the amount of, uh, uh, the, the number of prisoners and help with the overcrowding. Okay, I think we'll go ahead. Uh, Mr. Sheard, with a question. And, uh, Mr. Newhouse will be first to answer. This one's on the state budget gap. Governor Ricketts has asked state agencies to examine how they would handle an 8% budget cut for the coming year because of dwindling state revenue. Yet there are problems in departments such as health and, health and human services and corrections that seem to call for the state spending more on staffing. How can the legislature pass a balanced budget, yet meet its responsibilities to its citizens? Mr. Newhouse. Thank you. Well, it's not whether the legislature uh, can pass a balanced budget. It must. That's our Constitution. And so we have to do that. I like zero-sum budgeting. I don't think you should be able to go to the legislature each year and say, you know, last year we had $100 million, and this year we need $110 million. I want to start from the bottom and, and tell me why you need that money and what you're going to do with it. So I don't think that using a business model, there isn't an agency that we have that couldn't be cut back, could be pared back. Not only that, last year, we had a $60 million surplus at the end of the legislative session. And what did the legislature do? They spent every dime of it. They took $60 million, which we could use this year, because now we're $120 million behind. So you've got to be fiscally conservative. You, you can't just spend money at the end of the year because it's there. Mr. Quick. All right. Um, 
Yeah, I know this is going to be a big issue, this stuff coming here in the budget. And uh, I know there's already an estimated uh, $113.7 million shortfall, and uh, that's going to have to be addressed. And uh, I know some of the departments will have to make some cuts, but uh, we've, we've got to ensure that, that our schools, and uh, so we, they're, not, they're not cut uh, too deeply, so we uh, uh, because we need to afford our children a quality education. We also have to make sure that we fund our roads and bridges because that's going to create jobs in the state. That's going to uh, also bring in employers if we uh, keep our, our our roads and bridges in good condition. Uh, we do need to cut wasteful spending. I agree with that. Um, but we got to make sure that we don't cut it so deeply that we affect the very programs that, that provide for, for working families in the state and for actually for businesses as well. Thank you. Anything else, Mr. Newhouse? Okay, we're going to move on. Dr. Watkins has a question, and uh, this will be for Mr. Quick. This is actually quite related to what we've been talking about. The topic is income tax policy. Do you support lowering the income tax rate in Nebraska? If so, how would you make up the loss in revenue to the state? Mr. Quick. Well, for me, actually, out on the campaign trail, I've never heard anybody actually talking about income tax cuts. You know, I've heard them talking about property tax cuts, but not income tax. And uh, uh, I would actually not be in favor of cutting the income tax because we have to have enough revenue to uh, fund all the programs that we need. You know, if we're going to make uh, give property tax relief or or uh, cut sales tax, we, we got to come up with the revenue somewhere. So I would be against uh, any kind of income tax uh, cuts at this point, but I'm willing to look at it as long as it, that the working families aren't hurt in the process too. I mean, uh, I guess if you're going to give the tax to the, the, the ones who can't afford to, to uh, do the paycheck to paycheck, that might be one way to, to look at it. But uh, uh, I think if we're, if we're looking at at, at reducing property taxes, and that seems to be the biggest issue that I hear about. Uh, I'm not sure how we can spend it from taxes at this point. Mr. Newhouse. Thank you. Well, of course, property taxes uh, are a big issue, but, but the thing about income tax, and I think the premise of your question is incorrect, every time income tax rates are reduced, income tax revenues go up works every time. It always has, it always will. Because people will make more money. And when you reduce the tax rate on corporations and businesses in this, in this state, you'll attract more business. They will pay higher wages. That increases the, the income available to be taxed. So, you know, I don't, I don't know that I suggest any drastic cuts in the rates, but we're one of the highest taxed states in the nation including our income tax rates. And, you know, it doesn't take much income to get to Nebraska's highest tax rate. You don't have to have that much money to get there. And so, you know, I don't, I don't think cutting tax is ever a bad idea. I just want to say that uh, we want to make sure that we don't do what Kansas did. I mean, uh, they cut taxes so far that it hurt it hurt their citizens, it actually hurt their businesses as well. And uh, if we're going to make a, a tax to some type of income tax, I believe we should maybe look at maybe reducing uh, tax on Social Security so the elderly uh, aren't, I know they're living paycheck to paycheck as well, they're having a hard time if they uh, can't make ends meet, uh, they're having a hard time with that as well. Anything else, Mr. Yes. I've campaigned. Uh, South Dakota gains, Iowa gains, Kansas gains. We lose. Why? Because we're taxing benefits. We lose seniors because they look at the tax climate in other states and they say, I can go there and I can live cheap. And I've, for eight years, I said, we need to do that and that will be my first bill. Okay, uh, Mr. Sheeran has a question. I believe we're on property taxes now. This is going to go to you. Yeah, you guys want to talk so much about property taxes? Let's do it. <laughs> 
Assuming everybody wants to cut property taxes, but saying it's one thing, uh, what would be your plan for actually lowering property taxes, and how would you replace lost revenue for local government entities? Mr. Gunnar. Again, I think the premise is incorrect. Um, when you lower tax rates, you're going to attract more business, you're going to attract growth. The state will grow when you, when you drop those tax rates. Um, we need to address the state aid to education formula. It's way out of whack. In, in the Grand Islands District, I believe it's about 45% now comes from real estate taxes or property taxes. Where, when we started the state aid to education formula, it was supposed to be a third sales tax, a third income tax, and a third property tax. It's way out of whack. And we're one of the lucky ones because we actually get state aid. We're one of the 15 or 16 districts that, that can prove that we need the state aid. But these rural counties, frankly, they might have a 65% uh, cost to the real estate and nothing on the sales and nothing on, on the income tax or very little on that. So it's not a matter of whether I want to. We have to because, again, we're losing people to other states. They, we're losing business to other states. If you lose business to other states, you lose that revenue. And so we have to do that. It's, it's a matter of survival. Mr. Quick. Um, yeah, the property tax, the big thing for me is to make sure it's equitable for everybody. I mean, if they're, I, I'm all for reducing property taxes, but we got to make sure that, that we don't cut funds for schools and for infrastructure, because I still believe that infrastructure is one of the places we can start growing jobs in Nebraska. Building roads, building bridges. Uh, it also, the contractors also benefit from that, along with the brings in living wages for working families. Um, We've got to just make sure that, that and I, I know our farmers get, have been hit the hardest, and maybe that's one area we need to look at. And I know they did get some property tax relief last year, and uh, we need to keep working towards that. And in the, as far as replacing the revenue, that's going to, we're just going to be really careful how far we cut them taxes, or give that property tax relief. Anything else? Okay. We're going to go on. Dr. Watson has a question, I believe, on school funding. Yes, and the question is a little bit long, but it's an important and complex topic. According to the Open Sky Policy Institute, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization focused on budget and tax policy, every tax study in Nebraska since 1962 has noted a heavy reliance on property taxes and a low level of state support for K-12 education. Nationally, Nebraska has been ranked in the bottom tier and, in fact, is currently 49th in state aid to education. The Institute also suggests that Nebraska may want to consider <coughs> promoting the goals of quality, fairness, and equity in educational opportunities for all students in the state. Do you support these goals as well as reduced reliance on property tax? Why or why not? Mr. Quick. Well, I support public education. I also support uh, our community colleges and, uh, and our uh, trade schools in the state. Um, I know Nebraska ranks 49th in, in, the, in the country as far as state aid for public schools, and that's something that we need to improve on. Um, you know, for me, uh, working in a skilled labor trade, I know uh, if we can get these kids and I know the Career Pathways Institute's done a great job of, uh, of, bringing, of allowing, allow, allowing kids in high school the opportunity to experience um, a skilled labor trade. And so they get the choice, they get to, to go through that, and they get to uh, decide whether they want to go into college or whether they want to go into a skilled labor trade, and they get that opportunity. And that's something we need, we need to work on in the state, is to, uh, is to um, grow that and maybe uh, get it into other schools as well. I know Grand, Grand Island Senior High, I believe, is even inviting kids from, from out state or from the surrounding areas to come in. And uh, that's something that we need to do because I think it's going to help businesses, it's going to help working families, it's going to help provide uh, uh, for the employers as well. Mr. Newhouse? I'm glad he got that question first, but I think I've forgotten the question. Um, Are you committed yet? No, <laughs> no please. <laughs> I'm a product of public education. You know, I support it strongly, uh, but I'm a but I'm a believer that growth is is what we need. We need to.
to grow our economy, we need to increase wages systemically, not artificially. We need to attract business. We need to retain business. I'm afraid we're not going to lose one in western Nebraska. And that's going to really negatively affect that, that city because virtually everyone is dependent upon that business. Um, you know, I've been a, a big proponent of uh, vocational education for a long time. Not everyone should go to college. You shouldn't go to college, spend four years, and have $100,000 worth of debt that you can't repay with a job that you can't get. So I've been a big proponent of, of uh, vocational education. I think we need to expand that. Uh, I, like, I, I like career pathways. Uh, in fact, eight years ago, I was on the stage in Walnut and suggested that we need a cooperation between school districts and private business. And two years later, guess what? We, we got career pathways. So I've been a big proponent of that, uh, as well as uh, Mr. Quick. Anything else? We're going to move on. Jack uh, Shear had a question on economic development. Well, this kind of fits directly with what you guys have both mentioned uh, a few times here tonight. We do have low unemployment in Nebraska and housing shortages. Uh, Nebraska faces special challenges in growing our economy because of those factors. What strategies would you pursue, pursue to do each of the following things? Attract desired businesses and skilled workers to our state develop the skills of the existing workforce, help existing business, businesses thrive, and diversify Nebraska's economy. Mr. Newhouse. Well, we do need to work on our infrastructure because that's the key to attracting, that's one of the keys to attracting business. The others are reducing taxes and reducing regulations. When you over-regulate, you, you push business out of your state and when you overtax, you push business out of your state. You're not going to attract, attract anyone. I've, I've spoken, of course, on vocational education. I think we do need to increase that. Career Pathways is a great example, but some of the smaller districts can't do that. We do need to, we do need to have that. We need to attract business by making a good climate. We need a trained workforce with vocational education. We need to reduce taxes. We need to reduce regulation. When we do that, we bring them in. They pay higher wages because there's competition. You said that, that we have low unemployment, but we have very high underemployment. Our people don't make enough money in the state. You know? And minimum wage isn't the answer. They just don't make enough money because you, you've got all these competing interests. Uh, businesses think they want or say they want or, they, or need this, this illegal uh, element, but that drives down wages. You know? We could have a higher, higher standard and a, and a higher wage if we eliminate that issue. Mr. Quick? Well, we've got to, for, for starters, we've got to keep the businesses we have here that uh, provide living wages. And then along that path, we've got to also entice other businesses to come into the state. And I think we do that with uh, like places like the Career Pathways Institute that uh, allows children to develop a skilled labor trade and, and decide to go on that, on that path. Um, along that too, we got to get the employers that are here now, and maybe the ones coming in, to buy into the fact that some of the people that they hire, they could send to community college or tech schools to further their education. I think that's going to benefit the employee. Uh, it's going to create a higher wage for him or her. It's also going to uh, uh, help the employer by providing them a skilled laborer. And uh, I think that's very important to uh, to uh, on, for for the employers to uh, make sure that we that they buy into it somehow and be a part of it. And uh, anything else? I just think it's the the labor side is only one side of it. Uh, you're not going to attract business with only labor. You have to reduce regulation and you have to reduce taxes. It's the only way. Yeah, did you want to follow up? Yeah, it was a long question. So there was a couple things there that uh, I said. I want to get to the last one that neither of you really talked much about, and that's how do we diversify Nebraska's economy, uh, given these factors that we talked about. Go ahead and start again. Yeah. Uh, just like I said, you reduce taxes, you reduce regulation. That's the key. Uh, and, and you can train these, ch these uh, youth, these children, vocational education, including tech education. That's how you attract every business, 
It's not just manufacturing. It's not just beef packing. It's not. It's every business, including tech. I, Nebraska is the perfect state for tech because we're, we're huge in, in area, but very few people. And that's where tech is great, and, and agricultural tech is great. And that's a, that's a huge industry now. And I, I talked with a number of, of, uh, of the agricultural people, the uh, Farm Bureau, for example. They declared that I'm a friend of agriculture. And part of that was because I believe in the, the technology of farming, and so did they. Mr. Quick? You know, and I, and I realize too, I, I grew up in agriculture, I grew up on a farm, so I understand the agricultural business. And uh, that is one side of it too. I, I know uh, along with that in agriculture, uh, to help even just the farmers out, they can diversify maybe some of the crops that they're growing. I, I'm understanding they're, they're looking into growing other, other crops besides corn and soybeans and, uh, and uh, alfalfa and things like that. Uh, um, I know the legislature will have to work on, on, on an issue like uh, allowing hemp to be grown because it can be used for a lot of things in this country. So uh, that's another way to, to grow the ag business by helping the farmers diversify their crops. And uh, my dad always said that uh, farmers sometimes are their own worst enemy because we grow, we grow, we, we're, we want to produce that 200 bushel of corn, and then we just flood the market with it, and uh, and then our prices drop. So, okay, I think. Can we move along, guys? Thank you. Okay. Dr. Watkins has a question. Once again, we're talking about taxes, this time perhaps the deferment of taxes. This is TIP, Tax Increment Financing. What is your level of comfort with the state law under which TIP is applied, including the permissible percentage of blighted property in a given municipality, and if elected, what, if any, changes to the law's details or philosophies would you support? Mr. Quick. Well, I know TIP has been, it's actually been real, very important at Grand Island. Um, and uh, I know that we need the TIP money to entice businesses to come in, which will create uh, jobs and, and living wages for working families. Um, I know just in Grand Island alone, and even on the affordable housing side, uh, what Ray O'Connor did with uh, Copper Creek, uh, making affordable housing for working families. Uh, we have such a housing shortage in, in this town that we, we really needed that. Um, one of the things maybe to look at, uh, I know sometimes there's been issues with the, with the 15 year rule where it lasts that long and by the time we get to the end of that, have we, are we actually going to collect the amount of taxes on that to benefit the, uh, the state? So that might be something we may have to look at. Um, other than that, we really needed to entice businesses and uh, employers to come into the state use it wisely. Mr. Newhouse? If, if TIF didn't exist in virtually every state, every state or something similar, and someone was proposing it now, I would say, you know, no, we don't, we don't need that. But virtually every state does have something similar. Um, I'm, I'm supported in my campaign by the Associated General Contractors. I, I've talked with them about it. There are so many projects that they say will not be built, would not have been built without TIP. Uh, I talked with Chief Industries. Uh, again, they said that wouldn't happen if, if they didn't have, the, the, hot, the new hospital wouldn't happen if they didn't have TIP. Um, uh, I talked with, uh, with a, a local contractor the other day walking, um, and he is building homes, and he said the same thing. So we have to continue that. I think we do have to take a look at it and make sure it's still doing what it was intended to do. I think that uh, you know, Virgil Harden of the, of the uh, school district questions the 15-year term, and it does seem like it's always 15 years. Uh, but that's something on the, the city council side. That's really not the legislature. We could go back and we could, we could mess with it, I suppose. But without it, a lot of things don't get built. And that, that's going to affect our labor force, and that's going to affect uh, our businesses. So, so I, I think we, we keep it as it is for now, unless somebody comes up with a better plan. 
Okay, as uh, we're going to have the candidates ask each other questions. Uh, Mr. Quick, you want to start with your question for Mr. Newhouse, and then we'll finish. Same 90 seconds. Um, I guess I'll ask a tax question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but since we're on tax, we have to ask it. Sorry. Um, so, uh, high property taxes are a concern of mine and most voters in Grand Island. You have stated that you want to eliminate state and federal aid to local schools, which accounts for 50% of the budget, which caused a significant increase in local property taxes. Mr. Newhouse, why do you want to raise the property taxes? Well, first of all, I never said that. I would never say that. I didn't say I wanted to eliminate federal or state funding at schools. I said I wanted to eliminate their control of our schools. I don't want someone in Lincoln or someone in Washington telling our teachers what they have to teach and how they have to teach it. It wasn't, I never, ever said that. Okay. Mr. Newhouse, has a question for Mr. Quick. Mr. Quick, you have consistently stated in your literature and your public statements that you would work hard for working families. You've also stated that you want to expand Medicaid or Obamacare in Nebraska. So please tell us what you think Nebraska spends on Medicaid now, how much more you want to spend, who you intend to tax to get that money, and how that helps those working families. Well, currently, there are 70,000 Nebraskans that fall within the coverage gap for Medicaid expansion. Those families are working families that, that are finding it hard to make ends meet. And so, and we're also missing out on uh, federal tax dollars that, uh, come into this, that would be coming into the state. And I know the legislature, the last time when they had it, brought it up last, I believe it was last year, they said that if, they, if the federal government's level of support fell below 90%, that they could revisit that issue, and then that they would, uh, they could vote on it again, and if they wanted to rule it out, they could. But we, we certainly have to watch out for, the, uh, for all of the citizens that fall in that coverage gap, all the, the working families that fall in that coverage gap. They're suffering right now. They can't afford the insurance aid. And, and that's why you've got people not getting on insurance, because they can't afford it. But if they get be afforded that Medicaid expansion, they can finally get on, get some insurance and help themselves. And they wouldn't have to use the emergency room or, or wait on preventative care to take care of themselves. So. Do we get to rebut? Yeah, 30 seconds ago. Okay. But. It may surprise you to know that out of our $4.3 billion general fund budget, 61%, excuse me, 31% goes to Medicaid and direct payments. 61% of that goes directly to Medicaid. That's $813 million a year. Then we add the federal portion, which is 51%. And that's just our money that we sent to Washington. They've taken their commission and now we get it back. So when we add that, we've got $1.6 billion we're spending now, and to expand will cost another $1.5 million per year. $3.1 million in Medicaid alone. That's 80% that's of our general fund budget. Mr. Quick, anything else on that? Yeah. Okay. All right, we're going to do a lightning round. These are yes or no answers, or one of them is a number. And uh, Mr. Newhouse, we'll start with you. Yes or no? Will you be voting to repeal the legislature's decision last term to do away with the death penalty? Did you say it that? This is what it says on the ballot. <laughs> I don't want you to miss it on the ballot. Will you be voting to repeal the legislature's decision last term to do away with the death penalty? Yes. Mr. Quick? <laughs> so I'm trying to get this question straight. Do I know this is a hard one on the ballot? So I'm against the death penalty. All right. This starts with you, Mr. Quick. Should the state adopt a measure that would allow medical marijuana? I would say yes. Mr. Newhouse. One word. One word. Oh, I didn't hear your word. No. Oh, okay. All right, Mr. Newhouse, this is a number. What should the minimum wage be? That's my answer. 
No answer. Okay. It should not be quick. Well, I believe it's what it is now. I believe nine dollars down. Okay. Uh, this is Mr. Quick. Start with you. Should the state consider any repeal of the inherit of the inheritance tax? Yes or no? I would say no at this time. No. Okay. All right. We're going to move back to questions. Mr. No Shearer, more lightning. No more lightning. Take my time. <laughs> more than one word is fine. Take your time on this one. Because it's an important question. What do you believe is the most important issue of this upcoming legislative session? This is the speaker. Mr. Comprehensive tax reform. We need to start from the beginning, and we need to relook at everything we do on the tax side. Uh, I think that's the single most important issue that we'll face in the legislature this se next session and four or five sessions after that. I, I believe it's going to be the budget. I think that's going to be the biggest issue that faces us in this upcoming uh, legislative session. Um, so many programs can be affected if we're not careful what we do. And uh, we gotta make sure that, uh, that uh, if, if we're gonna make tax cuts, that it doesn't affect uh, businesses, it doesn't affect working families, and uh, it doesn't affect schools, it doesn't affect the roads, because uh, we still need to grow the economy. So I believe the budget is the most important issue that's gonna be come up in the upcoming uh, session. And that's why I said comprehensive tax reform, not piecemeal, not this tax, not that tax. Look at the entire tax situation of our state and decide how we can make it more attractive to businesses, to the youth that are getting out of school, to the veterans that are retired and that are retiring from the military, and for our senior citizens who are leaving our state in Anything else, Mr. Quick? Okay. So we're going to move ahead. Uh, Dr. Watkins has a question, and uh, Mr. Quick, you will go first here. This question's topic is coalition builder. The unicameral is a unique body. We're the only state in the United States that has only one legislative body. It's intended to be nonpartisan, although I think it's kind of like t-ball games. Nobody keeps score, but everybody keeps score. <laughs> Setting aside whatever political party you may associate with, how will you be a coalition filter to represent this district? Mr. Wick? Well, I truly believe, and I've said this going door to door, uh, people have asked me what party I belong to, but I tell them it should be more about the person and less about the party. We need to work together, all of us, to uh, help the citizens of Nebraska. I think you see on the federal level uh, the fighting and the bickering that goes on. I think Nebraska is fortunate that we have the unit camera. We need to hang on to that because it's so important to this state. Um, you know, I, I told people too going door to door, the federal uh, senators and the House of Representatives would just work together to help the American people, they could get so much more done. And uh, I think that's what, that's what I look for when I go down to the state legislature. I want to work with everyone. It doesn't matter. I don't care about party. I care about the people and I care about the people that I represent. Mr. Newhouse? Thank you. Yeah, I get that question too. I, I don't just say we're nonpartisan. I tell them where I am, I tell them the truth, and then I explain the nonpartisan nature of our legislature. But frankly, I like the nonpartisan uh, effect because you can cross the aisle, although well, there's a lot, but you can cross lines, and, but you have to build a coalition of people that you disagree with. And you know, that's, that doesn't just stop at the legislative uh, door. You have to build coalitions with the executive branch, too. You have to build a coalition with the governor, who I appreciate his endorsement. Um, I've met, I think I've met every state senator, sitting state senator. I've had a conversation with virtually all of them. What I do as an attorney is not represent myself. I represent other people. And to do that, you have to work with people who you disagree with. Who, in fact, you disagree completely with. Uh, whether it's a criminal case, whether it's a, a uh, domestic case, you've got to work with other people. And I do it every day, and I've done it every day for 36 years. So you don't necessarily build a coalition there, but you have a good relationship with other attorneys, and you can work together.
together, and most every case you work on, you will settle. Anything else? Okay, we're going to stand the theme of independence, I believe. Sure. Although you guys may have just answered this question already, we're going to ask this one anyway. Given a political ruckus between a group of 14 state senators and the governor after the last session about their lack of support for the governor's agenda, describe how independent you would be from your political party as a member of the nonpartisan legislature, most importantly, representing the 35th district. Mr. Newhouse, you go first. I'm first, man. Sorry. Um, well, I was interviewed by the Omaha World Herald uh, last week, and they said something to the effect of, well, you know, you've been endorsed by the governor and supported by the governor. Will you be beholden to him? And I answered, absolutely not. And I explained that to the governor when we met, and we've met several times, but I said, there are issues that we're going to disagree on. And, for example, one of them is going, one of them is going to be gambling, because in Grand Island, Nebraska, in the 35th district, gambling is important because Fonder Park is important. And, we, and I explained that to them. We are going to disagree about that. Um, so, you know, you're, you're going to have things you agree with the governor on. You're going to have things you disagree with the governor on. Um, I, I don't have any problem going with something that I believe in. If the governor believes in it too, great. If he doesn't, that's okay too, because I'm going to be beholden to the 35th district and to the Nebraska citizen. Mr. Quick? And as I said, I want to work with all of the state legislators down there. I mean, uh, to me, it's not about party affiliation. It's about helping those in the 35th district. It's about helping all Nebraskans. Um, I did have a state senator one time tell me, uh, and he was a Republican state senator from out North Platte. And uh, he's a great guy, and we had a great conversation. And he, uh, he told me, he says, the one thing I want you to remember, every time you cast a ballot down there, uh, it's going to affect every single Nebraska. So remember that what you do, you know, and be, be uh, ever so conscious of what you do, because it's going to affect someone in the state, or everyone in the state. And, uh, you know, as far as working with the governor, you know, like I said, I'm willing to listen to anybody, and he'll, I'm sure he'll bring down those issues to us and, and want us to uh, to look at those. And, and and from that point, we have to decide whether we're going to if it's going to help Nebraskans. The legislature has to decide whether it's going to help Nebraskans or if it's uh, or if it's not. So we'll have to vote on those issues, and I'm willing to, to work with the other senators to come to that decision and uh, be representative of the 35th district. Yeah. Okay. We're just talking about that district a little bit. Dr. Hawkins has a question, and Mr. Quick can go first. The topic of this question is unique district. What makes legislative district 35 <coughs> unique or different, if you prefer, from the other legislative districts in Nebraska? And how will those unique characteristics affect the issues that you will support or not support in the unicameral? In particular, we would like you to address how we continue to maintain the robust economic development that the community has enjoyed. We have low unemployment, but many of those jobs are minimum wage and they're not well-paying jobs. And finally, what really makes us unique as an out-state area is that we have almost 10,000 students in the Grand Island Public Schools and approaching something like 70% of those students come from low-income families. How do we educate them? Mr. Quirk? That's a big question. <laughs> but, uh, and I do realize I, I, you know, I've covered the whole district, and uh, I was really surprised going door to door how many poor and working poor live in this community. Uh, people working two or three jobs to make ends meet. And uh, there's just so many of them out there that. Uh, We've got to do something to help them, and uh, uh, bringing in jobs, living jobs at pretty living wages is one of them. Um, so I am a big supporter of the econ economic development and trying to bring in uh, employers that were pretty living wages. I know Grand Island has grown so fast; we've almost outgrown uh, our the outgrown the jobs that, that provide living wages. 
Uh, there's been a lot of service jobs come in, you know, restaurants, and those are all great, and we're happy to have them. But uh, they don't provide the living wage to meet to meet uh, uh, what working families need. And as far as education, and I'm telling you, education is so important, and we got to start with the preschoolers. I mean, it's uh, to build that foundation, and uh, so we're going to have to find a way, and I'd like to work on that uh, to provide for those children to to receive that quality education because they're, they're going to become uh, our next providers. You know, they're, they're going to become our next citizens that, and grow up to be, uh, I'll stop that. Mr. Newhouse? Well, I've also walked the entire district and we have the richest of the rich and we have the poorest of the poor in our district and they live within a mile or two of each other. And I tell people, uh, people that I associate with, um, middle class, upper middle class, yeah. I tell you don't have a clue what some of the people in our district go through. Go to their home, look in the door, talk to them, but you don't really have a clue. On the other hand, some of the, the poor, or poorer economically poor people don't understand the other side, and they don't understand that it's that it's not all gift, it's not all who you who you were born into. You know, there's hard work involved. There's hard work involved on both sides. And I, I'm glad you said something. We are underemployed in this state. You know, we've got way too many minimum wage jobs, and frankly, we have way too many under minimum wage jobs. People who are working off the books and are keeping wages down. So if you really want to raise wages. I think those are kind of the things you need to look at. Okay, we're going to move on to Shear. Next question, uh, let's start with Mr. Shear. Mm -hmm. uh, another two-part question. When you think of Nebraska in 2016, what do you consider our identity? And for the future, what do you consider the state's vision? Our state's vision. Mm -hmm. Our identity, um, I think now our identity is primarily ag-driven economy. And I like our new motto, Nebraska, great life, or, or good life, great opportunities. Because I, I think that's our vision, is to provide more opportunities. More opportunities for business people, more opportunities for laborers, more opportunities for families to raise their children, educate their children. And so I guess our, our vision should be opportunity. What, how can we make our state more secure? How can we make it more prosperous? How can we make it more inviting? And what will keep my grandchildren and your grandchildren in Nebraska? And I think that's, that's that opportunity. That's what we have to create. Mr. Quick? And, and I agree that Nebraska is an ag state. I mean, uh, there is a, a lot of it revol revolves around an agribusiness. And uh, somehow we've got to find a way to bring in uh, other businesses in and let them see that, that Nebraska is more than just an ag state, that we can provide employees for those, for those people and, uh, and, and grow jobs and grow the economy. Um, as far as the vision goes, uh, I think that probably plays right into it, is to show them that we have so many good people here. We have such a good work ethic in this state. I've been on both the East Coast and West Coast, and you know I have relatives out there. When I go out there, they say, you, should, you can go and apply a job for anywhere out here because they want people from the Midwest. They want people from Nebraska because they know we work hard. They know if we're going to get out there and do our jobs. So I think that's another thing we can look at and uh, provision for bringing employers in, they know that uh, Nebraskans are hardworking people, they're going to be dedicated to, uh, to their employer to, so they can provide for their families and do the best job they can. Yeah, yeah, I agree um, with most of that. When you do go to the coast, they do look to hire Nebraskans. And you know why? You know why they love Nebraskans? We're great people. We, we have great employees here, and we have well-educated people here. But we can't bring those businesses from the East Coast and the West Coast so that our children can stay here. 
That's the problem. They have better tax climates than we do, and that's why our children leave. Them. Okay, we're going to move on. Uh, Dr. Watkins has a question, and the first will up will be you, Mr. Quick. What do you personally, each of you, rank in the legislature that other state senators and your opponent do not? Mr. Quick. Well, I think all of my life experiences are what makes me a good quality candidate. I grew up in agriculture, and I understand agriculture. Um, my, uh, once I uh, got close to graduation, my dad told me I, we only had a 168-acre farm, and he says, uh, uh, I don't have enough room for you on the farm, so you're going to have to go and get a job. And that was news to me, but uh, I did go out and look for a job. And, uh, I've worked at the grain elevators, I've worked uh, building houses, uh, I even sold shoes once, where I met my wife, living with lovely wife Alice, so it was a good, good thing. Uh, I've also uh, worked in the public sector. I've uh, worked in, uh, also uh, with um, power generation, so I understand the utility side. Uh, I think all of our life, life experiences raising our children in Grand Island and experiencing all those things in life are what make me a, a good candidate. So. Mr. Newhouse? Well, I think that what, over, what sets me apart from uh, a number of the legislators and uh, Mr. Quick is my knowledge of the law. Uh, you know, I've, I've practiced law for 36 years. It's been my life. It's been my livelihood. Um, it's, that's my experience. I, I've already written laws. I, I have laws on the books. Um, I have good relationships with, with sitting state senators. I have good relationship with the governor. And uh, a number of the legislators don't have that. And uh, I'm not saying that Mr. Collette couldn't, couldn't develop that, but I have it now. I can hit the ground running. I can do things right away. I've, I've got drafted legislation ready to go that all I have to do is on November 9th it and it's ready. So my experience, my knowledge of the law, um, I think sets me apart from most of the state senators. All right, I think we have time for one more question before uh, our closing statements. Uh, Mr. Sheard? My think of the remaining question. Um, alternative energy, George, you okay with that one? Let's do the next one. Kidner? All right, all right. All right. Give me an easy one. Easy one here, according to Joe. If elected, how will you handle the situation with Senator Bill Kintner, who has refused calls to resign after being fined for illegal use of his government-issued laptop? Mr. Newhouse, your first here. I was asked pretty much that same question by Mr. Dugan of the World Herald. And I said, when I, when I was state senator, I'm going to be sitting as a judge, and I don't have the evidence. I would hate to walk into a courtroom, like I walk into virtually every day, and have the judge already decide the case before I tell him what the evidence is. So I've read the articles, and I, and I know that, and I'm, I'm disturbed by, by the things that Senator Kemper did. But until I really see the evidence, I can't prejudge it, and I think it would be terrible mistake to prejudge it. Now, there's a report. I haven't seen it. So how can I how can I say what I'm going to do? Um, and any of the state senators that, that have seen it, fine, they can they can voice their opinion, but I haven't. Right? And as judge and jury, I'm not going to make a decision until I see the evidence. Which quick? Well I, I think he really should have resigned, that's my opinion. Um, I can tell you that if if I with my employer, if I had used a, a, a computer that way and within my employment, I would have been terminated. I wouldn't have been given a choice. Um, so I believe I would probably vote that he be removed if, if I'm elected. Um, if he does remain in the legislature, I will still continue to work with him just like I would any other state senator. And uh, that's, that's all I got. Okay, did you want to follow up? I agree. I, I wish you had resigned, but that's not the question. The question is, how will you vote? And I can't vote until I see evidence. Um, 
I guess it's my law background. I, I just can't vote until I, until I see the evidence. Um, yeah, I, I wish he'd resign because I don't think he's going to, going to be effective for his constituents. Uh, so, but that's his choice, not mine. Okay, we're going to move to our closing statements. Uh, Mr. Quick's going to go first. You have one minute. Well, first, I'd like to thank all the voters out there. And I, I'd like and assure you that I have a real passion for this state. I love the state of Nebraska. I love this city. Um, we've lived here since 1980. Um, and I'd like to say, uh, starting on my camp, we started my campaign last August, August, 5th, August of 2015. And uh, since that time, I have not changed my values. I have preach to every person that I walked or talked to uh, that I am going to be a voice for working families into the, into the 35th district. We want, I want to grow jobs in the state, in, in the state and in Grand Island. We need to bring jobs in to create living wages for families. And uh, that's my main thing going door to door is just talking to you about working family issues and all the things that affect them and how I want to help them. Mr. Newhouse, one minute, please. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to the voters. Thanks for coming. Uh, thank you to Leslie, who's always had my back. The worst thing about uh, serving the legislature is the time that I'm not going to get to spend with her. Uh, Mr. Quick and I offer different philosophies and talents, and I think my conservative values would better serve Grand Island than his. But on November 8th, only one of us is going to be elected. Our country, our state, our city, they're all becoming more and more divided politically, economically, socially, racially. We need to come together as a nation, as a state, as a community, to work together. So instead of asking for your vote and touting my accomplishments, I ask that each of you stand, if you're able, and recite with me the Pledge of Allegiance.